And, you know, I often say to my clients, sort of leaders, spend more time just listening to people and you'll find actually you'll get a lot more done because they'll just feel valued, listen to, they'll share stuff and actually probably come up with their own ideas themselves. Hello and welcome back to this week's episode of the Ways of Working podcast. This week, I'm joined by Julian Roberts. Julian is the Chief Resilience Officer for Julian Roberts Consulting. Julian, welcome to the show. Good to see you, Jimmy, and uh, thank you for inviting me on. Looking forward to this conversation. Same, same. And, you know, Julian, you've got a fantastic background in all sorts of organizations. I see you worked in senior strategic commercial positions for multinational corporations such as Heinz, Yotplay, Johnson & Johnson, and a family-owned business. Since 2017, though, you changed tax lightly. You've been working as a coach consultant in your own practice with individuals and teams from various industries, including food, FMCG, retail, media, engineering, financial services, and the like. Can you tell us a little bit, how did this journey unfold? Talk us through your career highlights that have led you to end up as a chief resilience officer. <laughs> and yes, and, and I didn't realize that even existed. Perhaps it doesn't even exist. Who knows? Um, well, I, I started as a, I went to university. I did a degree in pathology to be a budding forensic scientist. And, and there I am today, uh, you know, talking about resilience. But I, that's what I did, aim to do. And I re quickly realized through my degree that looking at test tubes, lab stuff wasn't for me. I love people. And so I then worked on getting a career in the whole sales world. And I went into medical sales. I had a medical type degree. I thought sales is what I do. Loved it, enjoyed it. And then I just got headhunted into the food world of food because it seemed bigger, a little more sexier, a lot more dynamic. Uh, pharmaceuticals is more enjoyable. It's quite slow paced in terms of uh, sort of from a commercial point of view. And I started to really get an appetite for commercial and developing uh, sort of commercial propositions in businesses and strategy. And so the world of food was great uh, and loved it, enjoyed it, um, worked on various organizations that was named um, and as much as I love the strategy piece, love in the sales targets and the EBIT targets, one thing I really did, and this was, this was a reflection, and this happened towards the end of my career when I was in a, a toxic environment, and I started to really question A myself, but also question why am I doing here, what, what, what's next? And so I reflected on my career, and I realized actually it was the people side is what I really enjoyed. Uh, I remember when I was at Yopla, I developed a, a competency model which I didn't realize I was developing a composite model, but I did because I love to develop people. I love to f understand how people work to try and hone their skills. And I remember somebody from a HR, sort of global HR lady came to me and said, well, you should work in HR. And I just took it as a, okay, whatever. I didn't really understand what she was trying to say. Uh, but it was, I loved spotting people's talent. I loved uh, getting excited about uh, developing them. And I had this ability to unlock their talents. And I had like a coaching star. And I realized actually, this is all about coaching. And therefore, I, I stepped on this journey, left the world of corporate and started to build a career and a transition, a career transition and get trained up as a coach. And through that is where we are today in the last six years on various things. I've done a master's in psychology, various team coaching, individual coaching, NLP. I've probably done more development in the last five years than I have in the previous 20 years. And um, it's been a great journey. And as low well as trying to build a business, which is equally, as you know, exciting and challenging all at the same time. And requires a degree of resilience, right? And, you know, it amazes me how many people end up in the world of people development and working alongside senior leaders as coach consultant, whether internal or external, because they've worked in what you mentioned, a toxic environment or a really challenging, for me, an environment that maybe makes burnout happen. What do you think it is about um, the idea of resilience that is the thing that attracted you to build your practice around? What, what is resilience exactly? Well, it, it stems from the fact that I, I really got into the world of endurance sports uh, probably about seven or eight years ago. Uh, that sounds very grand <laughs> endurance sports um, and I remember seeing a an Ironman um, sort of triathlon on TV and I thought I want to do one of those one day and I wasn't a great long distance runner 
Um, I, I had a motorbike accident when I was 16, smashed up my leg, smashed up my kneecap, all the, I had all the things against me. And I knew it would be quite challenging. I wasn't a great swimmer and all sorts of stuff. I got asthma. So I had all these things, but I, I was determined to do it. And I, I did it and I did various, and along the way, lots of injuries and lots of impacts on me. But it, it taught me a lot about the, the power of not only of purpose, but of the power of just getting back up again. And the key thing, and this is where resilience for me is important. It's not just about getting up and gung ho and grit, determination. There's an element of that. It's the learning piece. And, and, and what I found through my, my trials of endurance sports is with all the injuries, I learned every time I got an injury and or a setback or I didn't complete a race for whatever reason, I would then think and reflect and go, okay, what happened there? What do I need to do next? You know, I remember getting multiple injuries on my calves. And so I think, okay, I want to get somebody who will give me a massage every two weeks to ensure that I'm, I'm properly supple. I I'd, I'd, I'd do strength and conditioning to sort of protect my sort of core muscles. And so it's the learning piece. And that's what really attracted me. And I, and I think, you know, for me, resilience is something you can, you can be taught. Uh, I think people think it's something in you, but it can be really taught. And I was fascinated by the, the topic, fascinated by how people do things, you know, having, and I say, I, I have lots of people on my own podcast who have do amazing things, amazing feats. And I just love the insights and, and what that does. And so that's my, I suppose my first full resilience started and, and I then started to incorporate that. And, and like all things, you start to attract that sort of people. You know, I, start, I, I, I work with a, uh, a team of athletes who uh, were rowing around Great Britain and for them for about 12 months. And part of that was to build mental resilience, mental toughness, as well as communication, team development, all that sort of stuff. Uh, and so I, I started to, to develop that as well. So that's, that's for me where it started. So interesting. And to build on what you said, one of the ways of describing resilience I've heard, which really resonated with me, was resilience is not being super strong or super robust or able to undergo enormous strain. It's almost the ability to experience that strain and find a way back, whether it's, you say, through learning or physiotherapy or through understanding and growth and it's almost that box that gets knocked down and gets back up again and keeps fighting because they're resilient. Does that resonate for you? I think it, it's it's the, the the key thing is this this learning loop aspect, which I think is really important. And I think it's taking time out to reflect on that. What happened? Why did something happen? Why did you miss, you know, a goal? Why did you get knocked down? Why did you get whatever it may be the context you're in, uh, and it's 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 re- replaying that and understanding it. And I think. For me, that's what resilience is about, and it's putting things in place. And I think there's there's ways and there's practices that you can do to make you more resilient and more um, individually, but also as a team. And so, uh, and I, I do a lot of work with my clients, and I don't just talk resilience all the way through it, but there's this thread uh, of resilience. And so, you know, I think you know, for me, having that resilience, whether it's an individual or a team equals high performance and, and so you, you can't have high performance unless you're a resilient team because resilient teams are you know innovative purpose focus you know uh, have clear processes in place and team learning flexibility trust the whole host of stuff that comes part with that so fascinating and you know you mentioned there that resilience is something that can be taught or something that can be learned can you walk us through what would be some of the big parameters or big factors that you would share or maybe have shared with an organization around building resilience at that senior level for our listeners? Yeah, I've got a great example. I worked with a CEO or number of CEOs a few years ago. And obviously, you know, just over three years ago, we were all facing, you know, the worst thing since we've ever faced as a generation, you know, with, with the pandemic and having conversations with people who were in a certain state of survival and the world's going to end type of mindset. We all went through that sort of process. And I remember talking to a, a CEO and he, I said to him, in your business, does your purpose or your mission of your business change in the context of what's just happened with the pandemic? And he said to me, no, not really. It's broadly the same. And in some sense, it should be that because the purposes and missions should be far bigger than you and far out there anyway. I said, okay. I said, well, go back to your team and 
revisit that purpose because where you get purpose, there's lots of energy. In there. If it's been done properly, there's lots of uh, insights and think about it, re, uh, re get your gaze or you lift your gaze back on your purpose because it takes you out of your situation, takes you out of the reality. I don't know if it should be in reality, but it takes you out of where you're at right now and inspires you and use it as a, as a platform, as an opportunity to say, okay, this is where we're at. This is our purpose. We've got this big thing in the way. How are we going to navigate it? And he used that. I, I didn't take him through the process, but he used it as an opportunity then to come up with ideas, ways of working. And he came back and everybody was more energized. Everybody was more up for it because they almost got back to their North Star. They'd almost forgotten about it. The North Star was far bigger than the pandemic, far bigger than them. And it created ideas to step back and think, okay, how can we get back to that North Star? How can we get back to it? We've got this thing called pandemic, got these challenges, and it made them more innovative, more creative, and and they got back on track. It was still challenging, but it mean they were all working together with momentum, with energy, with focus, and and it's using that purpose. And I think for me, that can be done in an individual perspective, but it also can be done from a team perspective as well. So getting clarity on purpose really is is, is vital for building or maintaining that resilient approach. What you're saying essentially is that one of the keys to being resilient is actually stepping out of the immediate situation that's going on and getting back to the purpose of why we're doing what we're doing in the first place. And then that gives you the energy and the drive and the resilience to push through those challenging circumstances because you're thinking about the bigger picture versus the immediate, Mm. maybe chaotic situation that you're sitting in. Yeah, no, no, totally. And because I, I think with, with resilience, the, the thing is, it's you need to be creative. You need to be innovative. You know, if you're going to reestablish something new and you've been knocked down or you can't get through something, you got to do it differently. <laughs> Fact of life is, you have to do it differently. And the, the way to step back and to look at the bigger picture is a way of creating that because it makes you think, okay, we need to get from here to here. Uh, what else can we do? And it just starts to create those solutions, those ideas. And if you do that as a team, it's really helpful. And I think that's, for me, one of the core sort of principles I would always advocate is is get clarity in your purpose individually, but also as a, as a team or an organization. So let's explore that a little bit deeper. How, how does one get clear on one's purpose? I know that sits in, in my body of work as well. So I'm always fascinated on, on other people's perspectives. How would you take somebody through getting clear on their purpose and take a team through getting clear on their purpose? Yes, <laughs> so it depends how long we've got here, but um, there's a number of ways. I mean, we, we know purpose is all about finding something that resonates with you deep in, in the core of who you are. You know, what's what your passion, something you do that you don't feel there's, it's not, not requires any work. You, you love doing it. Spend, all those things. And, it, and it's about asking those questions from an individual perspective. Uh, I also do um, a technique from an individual perspective called uh, logical levels with NLP. Uh, and it goes from an envir- external environment all the way down to your core of who you are, your identity. Uh, and it's a nice, good process. And I take my clients individually through that. And along the way, they discover bit more their behaviors their values who they are what their mission is and then ultimately what their purpose is but i think we gotta be careful on this because people get caught up on creating perfection and creating utopia i've got to find my purpose and you know i know simon sinek talks a lot about the unknown your why but i feel it's sometimes also an iterative process and you know for me as long as you've got some sense and, and direction of what that might be to start to act upon that and start moving forward rather than waiting for, I've got it completely now, I know exactly what it is. Because I don't think you never know until you actually start engaging in things. And you realize actually when you do start engaging stuff, this resonates with me. You know, I didn't think, you know, my, my purpose is, is, core, is at my core is unlocking leadership potential and creating resilient uh, people and teams. Now, I didn't know that six years ago specifically as unlocking. I just had this sense of, I knew I had to, I had this ability to unlock people's potential, but that didn't form until I started to do it. And I realized when I do do it, it doesn't feel like work. I love it. I'm passionate about it. I'm thirsty. I'm hungry for it. Uh, and also I'm good at it as well. And so that's some, for me, is almost get some indication and then start trying things out and start giving things different a go. Um, from a team perspective, it's a little bit more, a longer process in terms of working a team, getting them to sort of pan out 
what's things happening in five, 10 years time and just trying to take them a little bit beyond themselves, really. I think it's, you know, because I think people get caught up with, you know, example is, you know, Tesla, you know, people think of Tesla as, you know, their mission is to um, be the number one electric car company. Actually, their mission is not that. Their mission is to accelerate the world's view on renewable energies. Now, that is far bigger than being the number one car manufacturer, and it's far more inspiring and far more giving, and it's far more, it's just big, it's just huge. And in some sense, it's far bigger than the company itself. It's not about just making cars. And I think it's, you know, getting to that point where you take that a process where you start thinking that bigger uh, rather than just saying, we just want to make more money. We just want to be the number one car manufacturer, whatever it may is, it, just go beyond that. And because I think for me, purpose, there's an element of giving and community that come out of it. I think there's a sense of it's bigger than you, it's bigger than your company. Hey there, Jimmy here. Hope you're well. I just wanted to drop into this podcast and let you know that my new book, Beat Burnout, Ignite Performance, the leader's playbook for building a high performance culture is going to be released very soon. And if you haven't already, head over to my website and grab yourself the first chapter of the book absolutely free. The address you want to go to is beatburnout.jimmyburrows.com forward slash book and you can download that first free chapter to get you in interested and excited about the topic of purpose and the reason we're giving it away for free is because we think that purpose is the single most important factor for beating burnout and we want to get it into as many hands as possible so head over to beatburnout.jimmyburrows.com forward slash book grab beat burnout ignite performance the leader's playbook for building a high performance culture and enjoy reading touched on some gems there and definitely some pieces that really resonate with me. I like that idea when you said it, you know, when you're working on purpose, when it doesn't feel like work and Mikhail Chekhtemnehai's, um, excuse the pronunciation, work on flow is also very similar. It's that sort of when you almost lose track of time, when you realize you've been doing this for hours and you didn't notice the time passing, then you're probably working in your zone of purpose. And for listeners to try and identify what that is the question we also ask is why were you put on this planet and mm -hmm. it amazes me I've, i don't know if you found the same thing it amazes me how few people have actually spent time pondering that question they're so busy in the doing the day-to-day -day mm -hmm. doing that they don't get into the uh the deep thinking of well, what actually am i here for and mm -hmm. is the work i'm doing on purpose or is it just paying the bills and, and that can be a real shifting point when people realize, how does what I do connect with my purpose for being on this planet? Then we start to also uh, enable some more resilience factors, right? Because they can say, well, actually, I'm able to push through. I can see the point in doing this versus I'm just paying my bills. It's, it's the bigger than me thing, right? Well, yeah, and it, and it often encompasses people terming the phrase helping. There's a helping phrase usually comes out of a purpose statement, you know, I work with a wealth manager and, and yes, they want to make money. And that's why they're sort of in it. But actually, the purpose of this guy was I want to help people be sustainable in their financial. And, you know, that he was far bigger than just I want to make money from somebody. Actually, I want to help people do well with their money, invest it well, uh, leave a legacy, et cetera, et cetera. And therefore, it becomes and it's really good when you get aligned to your purpose and you start talking to people having conversations with potential clients or even friends, there's no sense of salesiness because you're just, it's just bigger than you. And it's usually a general sense of helping and you've got an intent to help that person. You know, I go to networking events and my intention is to connect and help people, you know, Oh, and because, Oh, you should have a ten intention to get, make, make, get, make connections and, you know, get some business that'll work itself out itself. It really will. If I'm there genuinely, I'll connect with the right people they'll sense that connection and they'll sense that I want to help them. And if they think I can help them, then let's have a conversation. That's fine. Uh, and I think that's how you and I connected initially was just a, an open conversation around the idea of podcasting. And yes. you're obviously a much more successful podcaster and far further down the track than, than I am. But it was that, yeah, I genuinely felt that energetic connection of, well, if we can help, then, then we can support each other and there's some value to be gained from that. 
I want to shift tack slightly and talk about some of the things that might be some real challenges to our personal and team resilience. Where are the things that may really put us under some pressure or stress that you see consistently come up time and again that once we're aware of, potentially we can start to deal with? I think the big one that surprisingly, it might not be no surprise to anybody who's listening right now, that comes up a lot is people try to control everything and you know, I do this great thing where somebody's getting stressed out about a certain scenario and I then say, write everything down that's really frustrating about this scenario, this situation. And this can be done in a team, can be an individual. And then I say, circle the stuff that you're in control of. And then they realize that that list is quite small. And then, <laughs> and you see that, that look on their face and they go, okay, that's why I'm getting stressed. I'm trying to control something I can't control. And I think that's one of the biggest realizations of, of why people get stressed, why people get overwhelmed, is they try and either control people or scenarios that they have no control of. And it doesn't mean we don't plan, doesn't mean we don't influence and all that. I'm, I'm not saying that, but you know, work out what can you truly control. And more often than not, it's only the things that are involved in you and controlling how we react, controlling how we respond. Uh, control the actions you take t today that will be for tomorrow uh, and you know i think it's the sas work on or the, the marines you're you're ex-military anyway so you probably know this but me they work on a principle of you know work on your next one meter square because that's all you're in control of you know if you're going to do a marathon it's you know i do a bit of visualization work yes focus on the end a little bit but actually the only bit you're in control of is the present moments and that's that one meter square worry about that and it's about the process and i think that's where people get caught up they try and get go on to the future uh, and and the things they just cannot control so that i would say is the number one thing that gets in people's way is they try and control things they can't control that's so fascinating the control your one meter square i, I recently read an article about a 100 mile race through a half mile tunnel and i think it was in italy i'm not 100 percent sure but the article was all about just putting one foot in front of another for 100 miles because, you know, just running half a mile through a dark tunnel where you can't really see the other end until you're almost halfway through it. And then you get to the end and you just turn back and you have essentially 200 opportunities to drop out because there's a, there's a refreshment stop at either end and you can stop anytime you like because there's only half a mile to the next stop. And the, he talked all about the resilience, the mental resilience of just I just got to get to the, mm. the other end and then I've just got to get to the other end and I'll just keep doing that until this is over, mm. just pushing through. One, but, but I think there's a real challenge as well when we look at resilience versus burnout, because one of the things that one of the, the danger signs of resilience is I'm overly resilient and then I keep pushing and I keep pushing and I keep pushing. And it's almost a misinterpretation of what resilience mm. is, which is I've got to keep going. How would you give our listeners advice to spot that fine line for being resilient versus almost being pedantic or pushing too hard and risking their, their health and burnout? Yeah, you make a, a really good point, actually, because I, I think sometimes resilience, certainly in the last few years, has been portrayed probably in a toxic context and all about keeping going and pushing through. And if you give up, you're a loser and... You've got to find a way and all that sort of stuff. Um, I, I listened to a, a podcaster, I can't remember who it is, or somebody on a podcast, and they talked about the greatest gamblers are the ones who can fold the best. So I think you have to get to a place where sometimes, and this, whether it's just starting a business, pursuing a sort of commercial opportunity in a business, whatever it may be, comes a point where sometimes you need to just quit and Quitting is deemed as quite a negative overtones or over undertone, whatever. Uh, and I think actually it's not actually. It's rather using that as an opportunity to see some feedback and some insights. And I often say to a lot of my clients, you know, what, what's the wisdom at the moment at this point? And, you know, whether if they're pushing through and something, it's just not getting any breakthrough. You know, what is the inner wisdom? Ask yourself, what's the wisdom at this point? Is it to, to stop? And that's okay. But by stopping, you're going to do something else. So in some ways, you're not giving up. You're just going to do something else and switch your focus, switch your energy. And I think it's important to have that language that actually folding is a positive in the card game. 
and they're the ones who do make the sort of the big wins, the big bets. Actually, we need to sometimes fold things in our lives and move on to something else and just switch our energies. And that's okay. At each point of life is then just to make sure, you know, you what have you what are you learning? It so every opportunity, and it sounds very cliche, you know, but it is true. And I think it's taking that time out to reflect and to learn. Uh, before you move on to whatever that might be and it might be change of direction and everything else so yeah learn to to be a quitter sometimes i'm smiling in a in a wry way because there's so many so many things that were so aligned here it's that concept of not being sucked in by the sunk cost fallacy of well i've put all this time and energy into this so i probably should keep going and actually the reality is yeah it might be the smarter more resilient move to let this one go so we allow ourselves to bounce back and be ready for the next thing because that resilience is almost the, the bendy stick or um, the ability to come back from being knocked over so you go well, actually i'm going to lose this battle exactly, yeah. to win that war is a much more resilient response no i think that's really beautiful the and i love also what you mentioned there around the idea of what are we learning here i did a, a poll recently on linkedin around where are senior leaders spending their time and zero percent of our leaders said they spend the majority of their time reflecting and deep thinking <laughs> and that was concerning to me <laughs> because the reality of this is as a senior leader a lot of your time should be spent reflecting on what is this the best thing for us to be doing what's the next best thing for us to be doing and how do we bring that to life for those people around me but we don't do that why do you think that is why do you think that we're not spending our time doing resilient deep thinking to make sure that we're not going down tracks where we're maybe flogging a dead horse or in the sunk cost fallacy or whatever it might be. I think as we're caught up with this thing called doing all the time and activity and hitting goals and making ourselves look like we're busy and doing things and all after it, all those sort of terminology. And, you know, we're all human beings. I think not, let's be more being and be more present. You know, that, that one meter square we talk about from an army sort of military perspective is all about being present in the moment. Uh, and I think, you know, it's a shame. I know CEOs and senior leaders do get caught up with what they have to do and they've got responsibilities. But actually, you know, and this is where, you know, I'm an advocate of coaching because I, I, I coach but, and yourself. But actually, those moments when I'm working with a CEO, that is probably the, probably the best time they're actually reflecting. There's somebody there who's facilitating and helping them. And, and actually, at that moment, they're probably thinking things through. And I often get moments with with my clients where actually i've not really said an awful lot i've just listened and create an environment that they can share and be, feel safe and actually they work it out for themselves and then they are oh, thanks for that and i'm thinking i just listened and i asked a few questions but it's they've reflected and i think it's sometimes reflecting out loud and i you know i always try and you know coaching for me is all about empowering people you know and i want to you know instill a lot with my clients that, that they can facilitate that for themselves you know find ways to go out and think a bit more you know whether that's mountain biking whether that's going in the sea swimming or whatever it may find your way that where you reflect and get those moments um you know it's 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 really important and it's i think it's a it's one of those things you have to sort of do it to see the impact and see how that starts to ref impact your uh, how you act with people and how you see the results of your impacts and you know i often say to my clients sort of leaders spend more time just listening to people and you'll find actually you'll get a lot more done because they'll just feel valued listen to they'll share stuff and actually probably come up with their own ideas themselves uh, and you're just going to gently guide them and steer them rather than having to think about you have to know everything and i think we're in that sort of culture and society of the ceo needs to know everything you don't you won't period really uh, and just sort of get over it and move on from that really so some some three top tips there then would be uh let go of things that aren't serving you listen more to your people and spend more time reflecting if you want to be more resilient would that be a, a, an appropriate summary yeah, of what we've talked great. about yeah fantastic <laughs> <laughs> i couldn't say that about myself Jimmy. amazing and <laughs> <laughs> and if all of our listeners do those three things then magically they'll become more resilient and their businesses will start to perform better we hope that's the goal <laughs> right now i find it intriguing as well often facilitating senior leadership teams 
it's almost less about the facilitation and more about holding the space for them to just sit and think and be off the hamster wheel of delivery. Mm. And it can be very easy for executive teams and senior leadership teams to end up in the high tempo of doing versus the thinking about how how do we as a team lead the business as a functional executive mm. versus being a group of business unit leaders who come together and do a whip meeting once a week or whatever it might be. Yeah, no, absolutely fascinating. Julian, I also know that I mentioned a little bit previously, um, you have a an excellent podcast. Do you want to tell us a little bit about it? Yeah, I've, it's been going three years this August. Um, it's um, all it's called Helping Organizations Thrive, and it's all about bringing on people and yourself, going to come on it as well, talking about leadership, talking about resilience. And I have people like yourself, so experts within sort of burnout through to youngest rower uh, across the Atlantic, uh, through to Paralympians, all sorts of people, inspiring people as well in terms of uh, leadership resilience. And it's, um, yeah, something I, I'm very passionate about. I love the conversations and uh, yeah, do take a listen. Amazing. We'll pop a link in the show notes below this episode for you to hop across and listen to, to Julian's amazing podcast. Julian, if people want to get in touch with you, what's the best way to reach out? Uh, you can use LinkedIn, type in my name. And a bearded man will come up and you might, um, so, so Julian Roberts, you'll, you'll see me there or go to my website, julianrobertsconsulting.com. Fantastic. Thank you so much. And final question as we wrap up is what's something you wish you had always done but never got around to doing? Yeah, I know you asked me before and I'm, I'm still trying to think. I guess for me, the, the, getting into the world of coaching, psychology, and and it's not, it's not like a regret, but because I, I love what I do now, but I, I wish I'd gone and done more this 20 years ago and, and sense of got dived into psychology more. Uh, and perhaps I would have been fascinated to learn a bit more about clinical psychology and be a, a clinical psychologist and just being a bit more aware of that more sort of the mental health side of things and had, had that experience um, really. Uh, I find, you know, you know, obviously I'm in the world of coaching. At times it becomes therapy and obviously I'm not a therapist and we pull it back. Um, but I, I feel that I, I would have loved to perhaps explored that whole therapy area. I mean, this, I could still do it now, but um, there's a lot of energy and time to do that. And I, I think what I do now is, is, is great and I love the impact I have. But I think that's for me, 20 years ago, be a psychologist, clinical psychologist, exposure, and helping people perhaps with some difficulties, you know, you know, I foster as well. So people have trauma and stuff like that. And that I have a sort of a bit of a compassion for that. And so I think that would have been a good course of action uh, rather than what I did. But that, that's, you know, it's, not, it's a regret, but it's not a, yeah, that's, that's, yeah, there we go. Not necessarily a regret, just an alternate path that you could have gone down. Yes, indeed. Wonderful. Julian, thank you so much for joining us, for sharing your knowledge and wisdom around the field and realm of resilience, and also giving us some really practical tips and case studies of where you've actually worked on that with teams. Really appreciate your time today. Thanks for joining us. Thank you, Jimmy, for having us. Really enjoyed it. Great conversation. Mm -hmm.